Good, so welcome. Um, I'm gonna have a few uh, kind of slides that uh, I'm just gonna use. Um, so just wanted to say welcome to the uh, introduction to watercolor workshop. Um, my name's Steve Fraser. I've been painting uh, since I was at school. Uh, so 25 years ago, um, on and off for, for the majority of those years since. And it's only really been the last three or four years that uh, I've really focused back on painting um, and trying to develop my, my painting skills and uh, improving and uh, my own uh, style. And I'm happy to pass on to, to you guys everything that I've learned so far along the way. Good, so we've got a question from the Dean already and uh, come on to that. So just making a note of that and we'll answer that question when we get into the brushes. So just to begin with, I thought I'd set the first half of the workshop um, reviewing key pieces of equipment. So that would be paper, paint and brushes. And there are other equipment that you will need and use and find handy. Um, but they're really the uh, the main ones. So we will definitely be covering those. Um, but we'll start off um, with looking at paper. Um, so the first thing that people normally ask me is, is what paper should I use? Uh, what should the thickness be? And uh, they're really, really good questions. Um, for me, uh, and for most people that paint watercolor, uh, 300 GSM, um, which is grams per square meter or 140 pounds, um, which is by the roll. Um, that's probably the, the main thickness and weight um, that you'd want to use. Um, if you're doing very light work, then using 240 GSM or, or something even lower um, also works as well. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can um, share this screen with you. So here's just a rundown of some paper and I'm gonna show you uh, in just a moment uh, the paper that I found um, to be useful. Um, so I'm gonna try and cover these four different uh, types of paper here. So there's so many different makes of paper uh, and there's a few that I've used, but these are the main ones that I found useful. So when I was starting out, I found that Bockingford um, was a very inexpensive quality paper. So I'd say a, a kind of excellent student level grade. If you're just starting out, it's a wonderful paper to use. Um, it's wood or pulp based. Um, so there's some pros and cons to that. And if you do find yourself enjoying painting, something you can move on to will be cotton based paper. So Saunders Waterford, uh, which is made in St Cuthbert's Mill in Somerset, United Kingdom, is a fantastic quality uh, cotton-based paper to use. Um, so Arches is also good cotton-based paper. I find it's a bit more textured than Saunders Waterford. And also the water and pigment seems to sit on the paper just a bit longer, staying wetter, and we're able to manipulate it a bit more. I find Saunders Waterford dries quite quickly, or I have to keep it wet a bit more. Um, and then you've got the option of handmade paper if you want it to be even more textured. One I use a lot of is vice versa, um, which is handmade in Italy in Fabriano. Then at the bottom of the screen there, you've got different three main different types of surface. You've got hot pressed, which is the smoothest surface that water paper, uh, paper will come in, watercolor paper will come in. You've then got cold press, which is the one I use the most. Uh, it's a lightly textured surface. So you can get some really good uh, quality um, brush edges and effects there. And if you did want even more texture, you can use rough. So they're the three main types of paper um, that are available here by most brands. Um, I'm just gonna show you quickly uh, a few of the paintings um, in the different types of paintings that I like to do on different types of paper. So if we wanted to start with, with Bockingford, um, this is a, um, a painting I did on Bockingford. Uh, I used Van Dyke Brown here that I wanted to blend uh, into this wall. So I wanted it to be very smooth. 
So I choose Bockingford for that reason. Uh, and the washes are very smooth. There's not a lot of texture uh, until you come down to the very hard uh, brush edges that I've used here. Uh, and I really wanted this yellow to blend into the black here. So I use Bockingford when I want to do smooth washes that will blend into each other. Um, if I want it to be smooth, but I still want uh, just a little bit more of a textured effect, then I might use this paper. This is Saunders Waterford, made by St Cuthbert's Mill. Um, I really wanted to get some real hard brush edges here and around the hair, um, but I still wanted some colors to blend in also. Um, so this is a, probably the most common paper uh, that I'll use uh, if I want to really blend some edges in together. If I want something the same, so this is cold pressed 300 GSM, if I wanted something the same, but a little bit more textured, um, then I'd normally use arches. And arches I find is just a little bit uh, heavier. So this is also the same as that Saunders Waterford. It's 300 GSM cold pressed or not. Um, I find the arches is just a little bit thicker and it can take a bit more uh, paint and washes without buckling too much. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive um, but I think is worth every penny. So this is Arches Cold Press 300 GSM. If I want something slightly more textured, then I'll use a handmade paper. Um, this is uh, vice versa. Uh, this is a rough textured handmade paper. Uh, and I really wanted these brush strokes here and here to be very, very textured. And you'll see that there's a lot more dots on here because it's so rough uh, and it just really helped give that uh, dry brush stroke effect that I was after. And here's another one. Uh, this is um, the last kind of texture. This is uh, also vice versa, handmade paper. Uh, and this is uh, a rough surface. So this is the, the roughest surface that I use. And as you can see, there's lots of broken edges here in my brush strokes, where I haven't had to move the brush too quickly to really accentuate the texture of the paper. And uh, this is double-sided paper. So I've got another one here on the other side, just a little study piece that I did for uh, a cityscape of, Lund of, uh, of New York. So we've got this guy crossing the road in the picture that I just wanted to practice. Uh, and then we've got this, this yellow taxi from New York City. And again, just one brush stroke and then I've got all this detail here of the very touch, textured rough edges. So any questions on paper? I'll probably leave a couple of minutes after each section to see if there's any questions. Um, I might not be able to answer too many questions about Canson um, or other paper brands I haven't used much as I've kind of stuck to uh, the paper that I found useful fairly easily. But yeah, any questions about paper? Uh, just go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on chat, uh, and you'll see that chat box pop up to the right. Um, if there's no questions and you're happy to move on, uh, just let me know and uh, we'll go on to the next part. Okay. So, oh, next part. The next section is so we can move on from here. Will be brushes. Um, I normally use three main brushes. I normally use a mop brush, a synthetic brush with a point, and a rigger, a very small brush. Here's just some popular brands. Uh, Herond uh, and Da Vinci make wonderful flat brushes that I'll show you in just a moment. I use flat brushes for big, smooth washes. So I won't normally use them on small bits of paper. Um, the biggest, or the smallest I'll normally 
Our bit of paper I normally use would be 56 by 38 centimeters, which is half of an imperial sheet. If you go down to the third one, you've got Escoda brushes. They make wonderful synthetic brushes and rounder Mamot brushes. And the last one, Holbein. Holbein have just started developing their own watercolor brush range a bit more in depth. And uh, I'll show you some wonderful pointed mop brushes um, that they make as well. So first I'll show you some flat brushes um, that I'll use for washes. So for instance, this wash here at the top of this sky, um, I can't remember if I used a, a mop brush or a flat brush, um, but it's the type of painting I'd normally use a flat brush with anyway. Um, so here's some flat brushes um, that I'm likely to use. Um, the one on the right is the Heron brush. So this is a brush uh, that's made in Korea. Um, it's made with uh, squirrel hair here. And uh, if I dip it in the water, you'll see that very quickly um, the brush comes to a very fine, uh, smooth point and surface here. So you can see it's very straight and smooth uh, and very flat. So I normally use this if I'm using half an imperial sheet uh, or 56 by 38 centimeter uh, painting. Um, if I'm doing a sky on this size paper, uh, this size paper is uh, 36 by 28 centimeter. I'll normally use this flat brush here, a 40 millimeter uh, or even a 20 millimeter. These are both made by Raphael um, and Da Vinci also make wonderful soft flat brushes. Um, this Heron brush is a little bit expensive. I think it was probably around uh, 30 or 40 pounds, 30 or 40 euros because it's actual squirrel hairbrush. Um, these two are just as good, um, but I don't think uh, you need the authentic squirrel hair for the smaller washes. So this is actually um, uh, imitation squirrel hair. Um, and these are a lot cheaper. These are just four, five, six pounds. Um, and I find these really good for the smaller, smoother washes. So if I'm just doing a blue sky with no clouds, or I'm going to do a very clean wash for the sea or greenery for landscape, um, I will sometimes use these flat brushes, but they're great for, for kind of flat washes. Okay, moving on to mop brushes. And I've, I've got a few mop brushes that I like to use. Um, if I'm doing uh, a smoother, a smoother sky, uh, but with a bit of cloud, uh, then I'll use a round mop brush. You can see here, there is a slight point towards the end of these two brushes. These two brushes uh, are made by Escoda in Spain. This is a size 22. This is a size 18. I'll normally only use the size 22 uh, if I'm painting on a, a full imperial sheet or a half sheet. Um, you need a, a lot of water because these brushes soak up so much paint uh, and water and pigment. Uh, and I'll use the size 18 if I'm using a half or a quarter imperial sheet. Uh, and these, I don't mind if they leave a, a round edge, maybe for a, a bush or some trees or maybe for some clouds. If I'm doing a wash that needs some uh, harder, sharper, crisper edges, so not round edges, but flat, straight edges. So for instance, if I was uh, painting this water, but I wanted some straight edges around here, but I needed the brush to hold a lot of paint and water for the size of the wash. Uh, then I use these by Holbein. Uh, this is the SQ Black Resable Mop Brush. Uh, holds an extremely high amount of water, and yet it comes to a fine point where you can make some really good, crisp, clean, flat edges. So they're the main two mop brushes that I use. There are a lot of other brands out there, um, but these are the ones that I prefer. Sable fine point brushes. So these are brushes that I use for kind of medium sized work. So for big washes, obviously big brushes, for medium work, uh, you get into the smaller point brushes. So for instance, when I was doing these domes, um, when I was doing 
um, some of the bigger parts of the holes on the boats, I'd use these. If I was doing these smaller washes here, then I'd normally use a smaller muck brush. Um, but this is for your medium to fine detail. Um, all of these brushes here are a Skoda Perlers. Um, the one in the middle is a size 12. The one on the left is a size 10. And this one here is a size eight. And as you can see, they're synthetic. So they, they hold their point very well. Uh, and they're really good for fine detail. Um, and as we come on to paint, we'll talk about the difference between pans and tubes. Uh, if you are using pans, then when you try to wet the paint, you need to mix it. And if you mix it a lot with these synthetic brushes, you will find you'll lose the point eventually and it will wear down and just become a bit blunt. If you use tube paints, you don't need to mix it so much because it's already wet and your, your brushes will last a lot longer. So onto the last brush of the main one that I normally use, uh, and that would be a, a rigger. So if I wanted to do some fine detail like these uh, very fine lines of rope uh, or these uh, railings at the front of the boat, uh, then I'll use a very thin brush. So this is just a rigger brush uh, it's got a very fine point. It's going to be hard to focus, uh, but as you can see, it's just a very thin brush. These are normally very cheap and inexpensive, uh, and the quality of these matters a lot less than the bigger mop brushes. So that's brushes. Any questions about brushes? I'm going to show you just a couple more in the meantime, uh, but if you have any questions on brushes, uh, just type them into the chat there on the right. So these are a few more other brushes. Um, and these brushes I normally keep for something very specific. So I don't normally use them a lot. Um, I'll normally use this brush here uh, if I'm painting trees. Um, so this is just a, a fan brush. It's got a couple more names, um, but sometimes I'll use this just for foliage on trees. Uh, this is a sword. So it normally comes to a, a fine point here. Um, but it has a bit more almost to the calligraphy edge. Um, this is a, a pure squirrel mop brush from Jackson's. Uh, it's lost its shape completely and that's by design. Uh, I'll actually mix the paint by pushing it down hard so that when it pops out, the, it has a very random textured edge. And then as I'm painting the trees, uh, as you'll see in a, a sketchbook in a moment, um, your, the edges are very random and just a bit, look a bit more tree-like. Um, this is a Chinese calligraphy brush. Uh, it holds its shape very well and can be manipulated um, into lots of different shapes. So I'm just wetting it now to show you guys. Um, so if I want it straight and flat, uh, I can make it straight and flat. If I want to bend it and have a bit of a, an angle when I'm brushing, I can do that as well. Um, and it also expands to leave a lot of broken edges. So I'll use this mostly for clouds where I want to have a lot of control over the shape of the cloud and also some broken edges as well. And then the last one, this is almost just like a big rigger. Uh, I'll normally use this if I'm doing big shadows that I want to be uh, thin lines. Um, but still hold a lot of pigment. So it holds a lot of paint, uh, but comes to a fine point uh, when it's very wet. So there's just a few kind of extra brushes that I use purely for uh, uh, special special effects or very certain effects. Any brush questions? If not, we will move on. Okay. Last presentation in the kind of uh, key aspects um, that we use um, would be paint. And this is probably the, the section where people have the most questions, more about colour. Um, but uh, the more I've painted, the less concerned I've been with colour and I've more 
um, try to develop using different tones or harmonious tones or tones to achieve an effect or an atmosphere uh, rather than using lots of bright vivid colors but colors are important um, so we're going to look at just a few of the leading brands that i've had experience with and once again there's lots of different brands and i've experimented a little bit um, but these are the uh, the main ones um, so we've got holbein holbein is the brand that i use the most I almost use it exclusively now, and I'm very fortunate to have a great uh, partnership with Holbein, um, and I use them about 95% of the time. And there's a couple of reasons. Um, they're very high professional grade, the same high professional grade as some of the other makes that we'll come on to. Extremely vivid colors, um, which is due to their choice of pigments. Uh, and the thing I think that sets them apart uh, apart is their high pigment count. Um, in paint, you have a few different parts of paint consistency. The pigment is the color and the most important thing. Uh, and then sometimes in paint, there are wetting agents and dispersing agents. Holbein is the only professional grade paint that doesn't use Oxgall as a wetting agent, and it doesn't use any dispersing agents, which means the pigment count is the highest and I think gives them the most vivid uh, colors to their paint. Daniel Smith, the second one, also a fantastic brand of paint uh, and their signature feature is that uh, a lot of their paint, not all of it, uh, is highly granulating, which means the pigment will sit in the uh, crevices of paper, the very small fine parts of paper and can create some wonderful effects uh, if that's what you're going for. But again, Daniel Smith, very high professional grade, very vivid colors. Um, then you have Schminke, uh, which is, an, an, again, another fantastic paint, very high professional grade, very vivid colors. I've used them a little bit, but a lot less experienced than the other two, um, but fantastic professional grade paint. And then Sennelier, which is a French paint, um, again, professional grade. The thing I really like about Sennelier is uh, it's easily rewettable. The consistency of the paint out the tube um, is very wet already, so I don't need to mix it a lot. And uh, I do enjoy using Sennelier if I'm painting clouds, um, as I think it just blends uh, very well uh, with water and the other Sennelier paints. If you're just starting and you're new to painting, a fantastic entry level paint is Windsor & Newton. Um, they normally have two different grades. They have Cotman which is their student level paint. And they also have their Windsor and Newton professional level grade. Even the student level paint, I even dabble and use it if I'm doing something quickly or want to experiment with something. It's fantastic paint. It's very inexpensive and it's as high level student level paint as you're going to get. So if you're, if you're new to painting, uh, Windsor and Newton Cotman is a, a fantastic paint to use. Um, I'm just going to show you very quickly um just a small study that i did earlier with some, some of these different paints and now these are different shades as well they're not all the same pigment um but you can just i find this quite easy to see the the smoothness of the paint um so the one on the left here um this is pyrrole red this is pyrrole scarlet this is alizone crimson and this one is cadmium red hue. So all different, slightly different colors. So slightly different um, uh, pigment counts as well. Um, but I think it's it can show some some of the different qualities of these paints. And again, I don't really look at paint in terms of this one is good, this one is bad. Um, I just normally think they've all got their own pros and cons, and they're all good for painting different things. So obviously, I, I prefer Holbein. I use Holbein a lot. Um, so you can just see how smooth this wash is. Uh, the pigment really blends well uh, as you start to diminish the pigment count and increase the amount of water in the wash. And you can see it keeps a very, very smooth wash. Daniel Smith, the same, very vivid color, very smooth wash. You can see the pigment starting to disperse a little bit here, but that's because it's highly granulating. So if you do want some granulating effect here towards the bottom, uh, which I'll just see if I can give you a slightly closer view of. Um, so less smooth than the whole bean, but granulating. So just a slightly different effect. 
Uh, the Schminky, I may have put a bit too much water on here. It doesn't normally bleed up so much, but again, very vivid color uh, and smoothed off well towards the bottom. And uh, Winter and Newton, uh, this was the uh, Cotman. So this is the student grade, um, less smoother as the wash is being dispersed. But again, a very high quality pigment. Um, so hopefully you, you find that useful. Um, any questions on these brands of paint uh, or, or brands of paint that you, uh, you maybe use and you, you wouldn't mind asking a question on? Uh, happy to answer any other questions. So, uh, Nadine, great question. And Nadine, I need to answer your question on uh, on brushes. How often uh, your question was, uh, how often do you clean your brushes during a painting session? Um, if I'm about to blend one color into another, um, I'll hardly paint, I'll hardly clean out my brush at all. Um, and what I'll actually do is if I'm using, if I want to use the same type of brush, but with a different color, uh, I'll actually make sure I've got more than one brush. So for instance, uh, I use mop brushes a lot. So uh, on the right, I have an Escoda mop brush with a point. And on the left, I have my whole bean brush with a point. So if I'm doing a sky or some shadows, I might use this brush and I'll keep this in my hand. Uh, and if I'm going to do some greenery or something that's a different color, I'll keep this brush in my hand um, and I'll keep them in my hand while I'm painting, <laughs> not at the same time, uh, but just so that I know if I need to go back, I don't need to wash it out. Uh, the more I find the more I wash my brushes out while I'm painting during the session, uh, the less control I have over the consistency of the paper. Sometimes there's too much um, water in the brush and I use the, lose the consistency of what I know is in the well. So if I've got some paint mixed in the well and I'm doing a wash uh, and I use that wash, I now know that the consistency, if I've mixed it well enough in this well, is what's down on the paper. If I wash my brush out and dip it in here, all of a sudden there's either more water or if I uh, dry it out, there's less water and the consistency will change a little, which will happen, um, but I try not to wash them out too much. Hopefully that, that answers your question. Um, and yeah, Nadine, your next question uh, was fantastic as well. Do they state how many pigments uh, are inside? Yes, they do. This is one thing that I really like um, about Colby, and I'm gonna try and get close here and we'll, We'll, we'll see if this uh, becomes uh, too blurred or not. I'm trying to just see if I can change the focus. I'm gonna try and put it on the sheet and we'll bring this closer and we'll see. Okay, so it might not be focused enough to read it, but if you look, so this is, uh, this is Holbein. Um, so this is brilliant, Jean. And uh, if you can see, all you need to see here is three things. There's a, a black dot, then there's three stars, and then there's the letter A. The black dot tells me the opacity of the paint. Um, so the full dot means that it's extremely opaque. Um, let me see if I can find a half dot. So here we have a half dot um, on the orange that you can just see and another three stars. Uh, and then another one, for instance, sap green, which is fairly transparent. Um, there's no dot, it's just a full circle. The, the stars to the left of there also um, denote how much pigment uh, is used uh, and the light fastness uh, of the, the paint as well. So Holbein especially, it's the one I use the most. There's also charts online where each pigment uh, goes into extreme amount of detail as to what pigment is used, the opacity, the light fastness of that paint. So yeah, really good question. Uh, Ratchner has a question as well. 
just scrolling through these questions. These are great. Thanks so much for your questions. Uh, so the next one from Nadine, sorry, was uh, if they still have pigments in them, but you're not going to use them for a while, uh, maybe you do clean them. Yeah, I do clean them, definitely. Um, I normally load load up with, with water um, in between just to keep the, the fibres in the, the brushes saturated. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll, I try and clean all my brushes that I've used after, but um, it doesn't always happen. Excellent. Just scrolling down to the next question. Uh, Rachna has said, in India, we have a brand called Camel, uh, which is solid as an artist grade paint, but is less than a quarter of the price of Windsor & Newton, Daniel Smith. Wow. Makes me wonder about the quality. Uh, how can one test that quality paint, please? Great question. So. I like to do this to test the paint right away. This is about uh, two inches by 10 inches. Um, I like to see its consistency at the top, uh, where this is probably three quarter pigment and we'll come onto this in just a moment. And this is washed down to its almost actual weakest wash. Um, so I like to see how the paint uh, gradually fades off um, as the pigment count decreases and the water count increases. Uh, and we will come on to, to something with that a little bit more in depth uh, in just a moment. Um, trying to see if I can. Okay. I was looking for something, but I can't find. I can see it. No. Um, Here's something that, that might help. So um, this is just uh, uh, something that I use to, uh, some language that I use with my students while I'm painting um, that can sometimes help um, explain uh, the consistency of the paint uh, that I'm using. Um, so if I'm using just a very small amount of water with my paint, this will be a weak wash. Uh, a one quarter time will be one part pigment, uh, three parts water. Half tone will be half and half. So half paint, half water. Three quarter tone will be three quarters part pigment, one part, one quarter water. And then pure pigment is straight from the tube. I think most pure pigment out the tube, even low grade paint, you can normally, uh, the pigment is obviously at its highest rate and um, it's normally fairly similar. It's as you go down the tones that I think the quality of the paint really comes through. Uh, as there's less pigment, the quality of the pigment is actually uh, easier, more easily visible and seeing how well it blends in to the other parts. Um, I find is quite interesting as well. Um, so that's the consistency of paint. Um, along with that, now we're moving on from brands into a little bit more uh, watercolor philosophy and technique uh, is the wetness of the paper. So here we have the wetness of the paint. Here we have the wetness of the paper. Um, so I might put paint onto dry paper. If I'm using pure pigment, I don't want that broken edge. I'll normally go into dry paper. Um, we have damp paper, moist, and then the wettest would be wet. So this is once the, we put water, a lot of water down on paper. Moist will be just as the wet paper is drying. And then damp will be as moist as drying or if we've just given it uh, a bit of a spray um, with an atomizer. So I, I use uh, this spray, I have a, a fine bottle spray. If I think the paint is and water is going from moist to dry to damp, uh, damp to dry and I want to keep it damp and moist for some wet and wet effects I'll just give it a spray this doesn't really spray uh, big droplets it's a very fine mist spray so it's enough that it doesn't disrupt the paint or what's down there or make two areas of the pa uh, paper too wet it just gives a nice even mist uh, that keeps the painting alive so yeah I think uh, that quality of the camel you'll find if you try and use camel with a weak one quarter and a half tone wash, you'll probably start to see the quality of the paint come through uh, quite easily. So yeah, good question, uh, Rachna. 
Good, great. Uh, I'm really glad that was helpful. Fantastic. Okay, so there's some brands. Uh, we've we've looked at a little bit of um, paint. We've looked at paper. We've looked at brushes, uh, and we've just started to touch on um, some uh, watercolor theory in terms of the consistency of paint and consistency of water. Uh, is it possible, um, Humaira, apologies if I've got your name wrong, Humaira, um, has asked, is it possible to create the same effect for moist and wet uh, via a wet brush? Is it possible to create the same effect for moist and wet via a wet brush? So in terms of uh, moist and wet, um, yes, so if I want the paper to be wet, I will load up a big brush with a lot of water uh, and I'll apply the water along the top. And if I can see, um, if I look at the paper at an angle, I can tell how wet the paper is by the sheen on the water, on the paint, uh, I'm sorry, on the paper. Um, if I can see that I'm running out of water, I'll just load up the brush again um, with water and I'll just keep it as wet as possible. If I want the paper to be moist with the same brush, I won't load it up. I'll normally dip it in the water, squeeze a little bit out if I need to, and run it across the paper a bit quicker. So you can achieve the same effects or the same wetness of the paper with the same brush. It's just how you apply it uh, and how much water you've got on your brush. Hopefully that helps, Humaira. Uh, Ratchana, you're more than welcome, no problem. Okay. Cool. OK. Yeah, good. <laughs> so we're about halfway through um, and we've got 45 minutes left. So I thought what I would do would be to show you from scratch how I would paint a small painting. So we'll go over setup. Um, we'll go over planning the painting. So sketching and drawing. Uh, we'll go over initial first washes and we'll look at the consistency of the paint and then we'll look at secondary and third washes and detail. Um, so I'm gonna start from scratch just so that you can see the process. Um, we'll probably take just uh, literally a, a 60 second break. And this will be that if you've got any other questions, uh, you can type them in now uh, and I can answer those before we get started. So any final questions about equipment, brushes, paint, paper, um, or a little bit of the, um, uh, a little bit of the paint and paper consistency. Any questions on any of those things? Okay, cool. So, uh, I'm going to paint a cityscape and uh, I'm going to go from scratch. Um, I'm going to use some, um, uh, this is handmade paper. So it's um, it's the equivalent of cold pressed, but it's highly textured. Um, the board that I have is at an angle of about 25 degrees. Uh, so so Paro, that we're going to talk about uh, mixing colours and I've got my palette here on the screen so I can show you uh, how I mix the colours. So first off, um, 25 degree angle for this one. If I was painting a rainy day and I wanted it to run, I'd put it at a higher angle. Somewhere around 40 or maybe 50, 60 degrees. So the paint would run down quickly. But here I don't want it to run down too much. But I do want the pigment to slightly run down the paper and be darker towards the bottom. So that's the angle. Uh, I normally then use a board uh, that I can move around if I need to. It's just not fixed. I don't like using uh, an easel or like something that's uh, a bit quicker. So this is just corrugated plastic. Uh, I'll put my paper on. Uh, and then a, a popular question is normally about masking tape. Um, I always tape my paper down. Uh, I'll put half of the tape across the paper and half the tape on the board. 
Uh, this is, it's just painter's masking tape. Um, it's very cheap. I think it's one pound for a whole roll. I buy it on eBay. Uh, it's not super sticky, uh, but it's also tacky enough that it will stop the wash going underneath it and into the paper, which will leave a, a nice cream crisp edge, crisp edge. So apologies if this is something you've already done a lot, but for, for some people who are beginning, this is sometimes a big question. Um, so I'll show you how I take this. I'll normally just measure out how the distance. I'll then put half over the paper and half over the board. I'll make sure it's firmly down on the board. And then I'll make sure that this edge is firmly stuck to the paper so that we have a nice clean, clean crisp edge when we peel it off at the end. If I leave this on the paper overnight, or it gets very warm or hot, or I leave it on it for two or three days. When I peel it off, it may either get a little bit sticky or it may even tear the paper slightly. So there's a little technique for peeling it off uh, that I'll give you as well. I'm just gonna do the other edges here. Uh, if you want to paint along, you're more than welcome. Uh, normally when I paint, a subject, um, I'll send out a subject photo. Um, I'm just gonna paint from memory today. Um, like I said, normally I send out a photo, but today you can, uh, you can just follow a long sketch or, uh, or try it later on. I will send you all a recording of the video. So everyone will get a recording of this video. Um, so if you did wanna, Try it later on, uh, you're more than welcome. So I just make sure that the these edges are stuck to the board and that the edge of the masking tape is firmly down on the paper and there's no gaps where an initial wash uh, might sneak through. So we're going to paint. Uh, just a cafe scene. It's uh, a very similar uh, scene to what I did in a workshop a couple of weeks ago. Um, about one quarter of the page, I'll just move this up so you guys can see. About one quarter of the page uh, will be the, the street or the shadow. Uh, another quarter of the page uh, will be the top of an awning coming down uh, across the street. Uh, and the top two quarters uh, will be windows. Uh, so I'm just using a, a 4B pencil. Uh, it's quite a thick one and I'm just using that so you can see uh, on the screen. Um, so a bit more about my setup. Um, Obviously I've got lots of paint on hand and uh, I've got my uh, palette on hand here. This is a whole bean palette. Uh, the wells are very deep. Uh, so I can do uh, a lot of washes if I need to with a lot of water, bigger washes. Uh, just a quick rundown of the colors that I've got here. Uh, so I've got Chinese white uh, at this end and I've got lamp black at the other end. So. Uh, I just kind of keep them in in a certain order and areas that I like to use them. Uh, this is uh, hookers green here. So this is probably the, one of the darkest greens that I use. And I find it easier to make it lighter by keeping the yellow next to it. So this is hookers green, cadmium yellow. Uh, this is normally yellow that I mix with blue to make my own greens. Uh, I don't like to use green out the tube so much. I do like to mix it myself. Um, so this is a cobalt blue. Uh, I then have French ultramarine blue, which is a granulating blue. Uh, I then have marine blue, uh, turquoise, horizon blue, purple lake, pyrrole red, brilliant orange, yellow ochre, uh, Van Dyke brown, sepia, which is a very dark brown, and then lamp black. And then across here, uh, these are mainly opaque colors. So I have lavender here, 
Grey of Grey, Brilliant Jaune, uh, Payne's Grey, and Neutral Tint. So uh, use Neutral Tint and Payne's Grey a lot for shadows. Um, I don't normally mix, uh, clean out my palette just in case I want to use the, uh, the leftovers for initial wash uh, that we might do with some of this. Uh, and some of it I'll clean out. So I'll always make sure I've got some kitchen tissue on hand. Um, I normally keep all my brushes around here, this general area. Uh, and then just off the screen, I've got two pots. So you can see one pot of water here, and there's actually another pot of water behind it. And I like using two pots because if I want to clean a brush out, I'll use one, the bigger pot normally. Then if I want to wet a brush, I'll use the smaller pot. So one stays dirty and one stays fairly clean for as long as I want. Uh, so that's pretty much my setup. I like to have everything around me and on hand and, and visible. Okay, let's sketch a little bit more. So this is just a cityscape, so we don't have to worry too much about perspective um, or skies. Uh, this is more about the washes um, that we're going to do. Um, so the awning here will be the, the main centerpiece. Uh, so this is going to be a nice bright red um, and I'll work my way down. Um, I'm just going to do these really brief lines. When I do lines, I don't normally bring my uh, pencil off the paper and uh, I like doing lots of guidelines um, so that I can make sure I've got my sizing right. So these will just be windows. Um, the bigger squares will be windows at least. Uh, and each window I'm going to separate into half across, half down the middle. I'm uh, just keeping the pencil moving freely uh, and each window will go into eight. So I'm going to do this as quickly as possible. Uh, and just nice and loose, just keeping my pencil on the paper. And I'm going to do those eight windows, eight squares. I don't want these squares to be straight and perfect. I want them to be uh, just fast and loose because the painting uh, isn't about the windows. It's going to be more about the color of the awning, some uh, expressive uh, painting and color, hopefully. Uh, and these windows will actually be backgrounds. So normally in a landscape, uh, your sky and mountain and hills will be backgrounds. In bigger cityscapes, it's normally bigger buildings, a big church or a cathedral or a tower in the background. Um, so we just want this just to kind of uh, fade into the background. Um, there's just a uh, window ledge at the bottom of, of each of these. Okay, so we've got our awning here. Um, we're going to have um, just an archway here. Almost like a side door. Um, then we've got our uh, awning here and uh, the building inside, and we'll just put another awning there. Um, and then we're going to have uh, some tables and chairs. So these are just the tops of some tables. Uh, and we're going to have a waiter here. So this is the head of a waiter. Uh, his shoulders coming back and down, uh, and just smooth loose legs. The uh, tray that he's holding. Uh, and now we're just going to do some people sitting down. Now, because the people are sitting down, um, their heads will not be as high. I'm actually going to move these tables down a bit, a bit more lower. Uh, so we just got some people sitting here at the table. Again, when I sketch, the, the more detail I put into the sketch, the more tied I am, or I, my mind might be, into painting exactly how I've drawn it. So the looser I am in the sketches, the more freedom I find I give myself uh, when I'm painting. Uh, and we'll just have some people and I'm walking down the street here. So 
So there's our people sitting down, our tables, and uh, we just want some uh, table legs underneath, some chair legs, uh, and these will be nice highlights. So with this awning coming down here, we've probably got a few things in the background. This is kind of inside the restaurant. Um, and this, this awning will kind of make a shadow. We're going to have the light coming across from right to left. So if you just draw a line down at the angle you want it, that means the awning will probably pop out here. Then you've got a bit of shadow and shade from the building. Uh, and then we'll have a nice uh, shadow coming across the paper here. So this will all be shade and shadow. I'm just gonna shade it in so you can see. And these will be, uh, this will be a darker area with the light coming across here and a darker archway in here and everything dark uh, inside underneath the awnings. Okay, so that's a sketch. It's taken us probably what, two or three minutes and uh, we've got some gaps of, of people in here. And uh, we're just gonna put down an initial wash now. And uh, you can see the palette here on the left. Um, this paint, I haven't touched for a day. So I'm gonna use my spray and I'm just gonna wet the paint sitting in the, uh, sitting in the palette while I was there. Uh, the first wash I'm gonna do is just gonna be a very loose uh, wash. Um, I'm gonna use uh, yellow ochre and a bit of burnt sienna. Uh, I will clear out a little bit to make some space. Uh, I'm going to use, I'm going to leave this grey in here because I'll leave that for the shadow. Uh, the red I'll leave in there for the awning, uh, but I will get rid of this uh, turquoisey blue uh, so that I can use this area for the first kind of wash. Again, I don't. Uh, don't clean this out a lot, or at least as much as I should do. So the first wash we're going to do at the back will be weak. Um, so even some of the parts of the paper, uh, I, I may leave whites. Uh, I may put just a small bit of water on them. I may put just a small bit of pigment on them. Uh, and then to break up the flatness of the weak wash, while it's still uh, moist or wet, I may come in with just a little bit quarter or half tone just to break up. Uh, the flatness of, of the weak wash. So I'm going to use a mop brush. This is quite a small piece of paper. So I'm just going to use uh, one of the smaller mop brushes. Uh, I'm just going to use some yellow ochre here. And uh, I'm just letting it mix with this burnt sienna that's, uh, that's in there. And I'll just keep applying water, 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 and making it smooth. So I'm going to load up this brush. There's a lot of water and pigment on there. And uh, the, the main areas that I want to hit is just down the middle. So if I use the brush quickly, you can even start to see here there's lots of broken lines. A broken line is when there's gaps in the pigment that are showing dots of white paper in between. I don't know if you guys can, can see that, but here uh, you've got all those small gaps of, of white paper. I'll try and tilt it at an angle so you can see. And sometimes I want to keep them, sometimes I don't. Um, and uh, the more little white gaps you, you make, you can keep as many as you want. Again, I, this will be a very, very weak background wash. Um, I don't want it to, to register too much at all. Um, but we'll all come in and, and do some windows uh, while it's still wet as well. And now I just want to eliminate any straight lines. Uh, that I've got. I want a lot of broken or soft edges rather than straight edges. 
And if I can see that the page is getting too wet and the paper is losing uh, the wetness of the paint, uh, then I'll just give it a little spray across quickly just to make sure it's um, uh, staying wet and keeping the painting alive. While the painting is wet, um, I can change what's already down. As soon as it dries, there's nothing I can do to change it. So this is just a bit of um, burnt sienna in with that same yellow ochre. And I'm just going to drop in uh, a bit of burnt sienna here and there, uh, just to warm up uh, what is a, a sunlit wall. Obviously, we're, we're going to have some light and shade in here. We've got the light coming across the building, and we're going to have some shade and shadow underneath. So uh, we want to keep it fairly warm. I like burnt sienna uh, because there's uh, a fair amount of red and orange uh, hue in the pigment, um, which really uh, warms it up. And now I'm just going to put a few drops on just to break up some of the flatter areas. And I will work my way down here uh, as this is going to stay this lovely uh, Burnt sienna colour. This will be in the shadow, um, but we'll put it down now just to give some background. Uh, and this part will also not be in the shadow as well. Good. So while this is damp, I just want to come in and do these windows quickly. There's a lot of windows here, but I'm going to try and do them in about 120 seconds. That's my goal. Uh, and I'm going to do them really good. So I'm just going to use. Uh, some burnt umber and van dyke brown so it'll be a little bit darker i can just test it on one window okay i'm happy with that and i'm going to see if i can do each window with one brush stroke uh, and i want the shapes to be different so the paper here when i'm putting it down at the moment is wet and as i work down here that i've left this dry so it's just going to give some different kind of textures um, to the windows I'm trying just one brush stroke each one. If I spend all day going down and across and across and down and up, I might get all those squares straight, but it will look a bit boring. I, I want this to be in the background and just kind of fade away. Even here, while this is wet, I'm already going to break up some of these edges just by putting a bit more paint, paint down and also just dropping in some water. So this is almost just clean water. Uh, and I'm just literally blurring uh, the windows so they f parts of them fade into the, the distance and the background. Okay, that's one minute. Can I do the rest of these windows? Have a look. Then this is just background, so I, I really don't want to uh, mess around too much. Um, but I want it to register as uh, as windows. The only danger here is overdoing it. Now just some clean water just to break up the uh, monotony. I try to use slightly different tones to break it up as well. So it kind of gets a darker uh, brown. Just a bit more clean water just to break up some of the straight boring edges. I think watercolour is a wonderful medium for being expressive and denoting. Um, atmosphere um, and uh, if you do like painting as is or hyper realism uh, it's a very difficult thing to do and I think the people that develop that talent are 
the area wonderfully talented. Um, I personally enjoy just making it a bit more expressive uh, and atmospheric. Okay, so there's our windows, done. He says put in Norman. Okay. Now, that's our background. So we, we don't want to touch any more of that. It's, that's done. Um, now we want to think about working our way down. So you probably see that that first wash I did um, was weak. So it was just a very small part pigment down here uh, and a lot of water. But then for the windows, I just went to a quarter tone. So I went to one part pigment and a three parts water. Um, so it was just a little bit darker and more pigment in the windows. Uh, and then just here at the bottom here and some of these windows that are slightly darker, I may have gone to a half tone. As we come down now into the middle of the painting, I want to give this morning a lot of colour. So we're going to make this a really bright uh, pure red. Almost the same colour as what we've used here. Uh, and for the top part, uh, I'm going to use pure pigment. I'm almost going to use it uh, straight out the tube. Uh, and this will fade off as it goes down towards the bottom, uh, almost fading uh, to the black. Um, so what I'm going to do first is uh, I'm going to do a, a very uh, slight wash here and a slight wash uh, on the way. We'll let that dry completely. And then we'll put in the, uh, this awning and the middle. So, uh, I'm not really going to do too much here in the middle. Uh, I'm just going to put a wash down so that we can get the colour of the street. Uh, not too dark, so that there's a high contrast between shadow and light. It's just going to be a very, very faint wash. Again, weak again. So I normally put my weak washes down first. And this is all left over down here. This is just a... Uh, black or grey and this is just be just a very weak uh, wash uh, we can use for the street. And uh, I really don't want this too dark at all. Uh, to speed up the process I will use a hairdryer. Uh, I don't use a hairdryer if I'm painting at my own pace. Um, but I am going to use it here just to make sure that we can go into this when it's dry. Some tips on using a hairdryer if you do want to use one. Don't go too close. Okay. If there's a lot of water on the paper, the more you move the hairdryer, the more it will disrupt the pigment. Uh, and that might be an effect that you're going for. Um, I personally just try and hold uh, the hairdryer uh, about six to ten inches away uh, and I'll wave it a little just to keep the heat flowing over it rather than um, dispersing the pigment. Something I've already mentioned is the uh, the consistency of the paper in terms of how wet it is. Is it dry? Is it damp? Is it moist? Is it wet? Uh, the more you paint, the more you'll get used to recognizing quickly. Is it too dry to go in and do wet on wet? Is it too wet? More of my wet on wet will disperse too much. Uh, and you'll get used to identifying how wet, dry, damp or moist your paper is. The more you paint on one specific type of paper, the more you'll get used to it. So if I'm painting on Saunders Waterford, 
I know that it will drink it up quite quickly and it will go damp to dry very quickly. If I'm painting on handmade paper, sometimes the, the paint will sit on top a little bit longer and it will stay wet like it is right there, okay? So sometimes there's no uh, shortcuts to understanding how the paper works. It just comes with, with lots of practice and uh, experimenting. Okay, so now we're gonna do our shade and shadow all in one go. While that's wet underneath here, we'll quickly come in and do this awning and hopefully it will run into each other magically. Um, because we're doing a larger wash now, this wash will be um, pretty much a half tone, maybe a three quarter tone. Um, because we're gonna do so much, I need to mix a lot in the well. So I need to use a lot of water. Uh, I'm gonna use neutral tint here. Uh, I need to mix it so it's going to be smooth and there's a lot of it. If I have to, go, if I get halfway through the wash and I have to mix it again to make more, chances are it will be a slightly different consistency to what I put down already. And that may be viewable um, when I look at that later on. So by doing, mixing a lot here, like I am in this well here, I know I can do a big wash and it will be the same consistency. That's why I have bits left over because I probably mixed a bit too much, but I'd rather mix too much than not enough uh, and it not look uh, smooth. So now a lot of time I'll, uh, I'll spend thinking about what I'm gonna paint. And at the same time, I'm just mixing here. So I'm mixing for two reasons. One, to make sure the pigment and water is mixed smoothly and evenly through the whole well. And also while I'm doing it, the second reason, I'm just thinking about how I'm gonna apply it, where I'm gonna apply it. Uh, for this one, I'm gonna use the whole bean mop brush that comes to a fine point. And this is because I do wanna leave some edges here uh, in the shadows. Uh, I'm gonna negatively paint around the head of people, around the shoulders of some of the people that will be in the lights. Um, and we also want a straight line here for some of these, uh, uh, for some of the shadows on the street. Okay, let's go. So I normally paint right to left because I'm right handed. This way, if I paint on this side first, uh, my hand won't drag across the page uh, and onto things I've already painted. So I can use the fine point of this whole bean brush just to paint uh, around the shoulder and head and just keep them white uh, so I can make them uh, viewable uh, and put a bit of color into them. So already I can see that the, the wash is probably a bit weaker than what I thought it would be. It's probably uh, a bit closer to a quarter and a half. So I will just adapt this and put more pigment in and keep mixing. And now I can add it while it's still wet and that just makes it a lot darker, uh, which is good. The bottom of the people, uh, I'm gonna use black to do legs. So uh, I normally paint over them unless I want them highlighted. Uh, now we're just gonna do under the awning it comes down here and we've also got the shadow coming across from the awning as well. So I'm going to leave a few little gaps white here so you, to bring out the wall underneath and maybe some small gaps uh, in the awning here. And then the side of the awning coming around. And then the bottom of the awning, just minor weight of head, all the way underneath. And now I'm trying to work from left to right and work my way gradually down at the same time. And I wanna keep the bottom of here wet because we, the awning will go into this. Here's the side of the awning. And the shadow from the other awning.
Um, because the painting, the sketching part was very loose, I'm not tied uh, to what I've sketched too much. Um, so I can just negatively paint around these heads. So no matter how am I, how am I figuring out where the shadow should fall? Good question. Um, for me, the light's going to come from right to left and down. So I have to think about where is the light coming from and how will that affect uh, what is on uh, underneath the shadow and in the shade. So I'm almost not painting people and I like to try and paint the effect the light is having on the people. Um, so determining where your light is coming from uh, is very important. In, in the stages. Uh, if you're painting a landscape or sometimes a bigger cityscape, uh, a good technique to use is called uh, contrajour, which translates as into the light. So it's almost like the light is behind what you're painting and coming forwards. So there are some shadows, they're normally coming or angled towards you. Um, this one, the, the, the shadow is just coming from the side. So if it's a smaller painting, um, I like to do the shadow coming from the side, uh, just to cast the shadow and shade on uh, the different characters in the painting. The out eye uh, will be drawn uh, to the middle of the painting, to the waiter and the people uh, sitting down. Uh, so the shade and shadow um, really helps bring them to the fore if they're at the front or push them back if they're towards the rear. So now, while this is still wet here, uh, I could just put a bit more pigment on here, one to keep it wet, uh, one to darken the area inside the restaurant. Uh, and I also want to try and disrupt that surface so it's not too flat and uh, gives the impression that there's uh, some people in the restaurant behind. Um, so we'll leave those tables round here. Uh, I'm just going to leave a very few little lines here, white lines for underneath the, uh, the table. So some table legs. Again, it's another benefit of using uh, the fine point brush. Uh, there's our table and our people. So sometimes I use masking fluid for this. Uh, Sometimes it's uh, it's fun just to, to leave them. So I'm just going to leave a few white lines here underneath. You see the pigment is running down, so this is starting just to dry a little bit. I can see it's starting to dry and bleed up a little bit, almost like some cauliflowers because it's so wet at the bottom. Um, sometimes cauliflower is a, a fun effect, sometimes it's not uh, desirable. Uh, so there are ways to deal with that. Um, one way to deal with cauliflowering, so here it's just starting to cauliflower a bit. Uh, there's one thing I can do, I can tip it up. If I do tip it up, which is why I like to have the corrugated plastic. Uh, I have to remember that more pigment is going to run down here. Um, so I need to disperse that. It means that the, the wet pigment isn't dispersing up the page, it's dispersing down. And while this is very wet here, this is going to stay wet at the bottom. I'm going to do the, the awning now uh, so that it bleeds into the kind of darkness underneath. So I'm going to keep this brush. I'm not going to wash it out. I'm going to put it here. Now I go to my other not brush. Uh, and I'm going to mix some, um, some Pure Red. This is almost out of the tube, so this is uh, pretty much a three-quarter tone. 
Uh, I'm going to use a, a, almost a dry brush stroke across the top. Those highlights there. And uh, it's still a three quarter wash across here. So a lot of pigment, uh, a lot of red. And as I get towards the bottom, I'm not going to let it touch the black, the wet black yet. It's going to see if I can get this bit coming across here. Get a little bit closer to that wet paint here. I'm just going to put a, a little bit of clean water at the top here because I'd love for this red just to slightly bleed up and blend into the wall. So I'm just putting down a bit of clean water across this line, across the top, so that the red of the uh, awning just blends into the wall and it's not a, a hard flat straight line it's actually a soft blending uh, of the pigment into that dry wall already okay here's the fun part now we connect the red awning to the shadow underneath and uh, this is the for me the magic of watercolor uh, letting the painting paint itself and just making sure we've got enough water and pigment for this red just to blend and bleed into the shadow and see what happens. Maybe it will look good, maybe it won't and we learn a lesson, but until we try, we don't know. So, there's a bit of a sheen on the screen so I, I can see it here, so I'll, I'll probably just tilt it for you here. And you can see that the the red paint is just running into the black shadow underneath. Um, it's kind of gone in, in bits and pieces. So uh, I could smooth it out slightly, uh, but I don't want to mess around with it too much because I like the, uh, the effects. It's fun. And uh, I could even drop in a bit more water there uh, just to warm it up. Okay, while that's drying, we've got this bead of water, this shadow here. So the pigment and the water has run down. This is starting to dry here in this area. So the top of a wash will always dry first. Uh, and the bottom of the wash will start to well up. And that will remain quite wet. So now we can just finish our shadow because it's still wet. We can paint into that and there won't be any lines. So the shadow of the awning. So look, we've got the angle of the shadow here. Then the angle of the awning would be roughly here. So we can eliminate these white bits, come across and just give this awning uh, a slight edge and angle coming across. So look at this, I've, I've dropped some red paint here. Complete mistake. I didn't plan on doing it, but I love it and I'm going to leave it uh because uh because i can and i'm just not gonna fiddle around with it and maybe it will just look like a, a reflection or, or something i don't know uh, i'm gonna leave a few little white gaps in here just so it's not too flat and boring uh and then uh i'm gonna use a few little white gaps here as well uh, and then we'll have this big shadow coming across so this is a hard line this is a broken line uh, and I'm also going to use a soft edge as well. I don't want these all to be hard or broken. And now I can just use the last bit of the, the pigment to make it a bit darker towards the bottom. And I'll we'll just drop in some darker pigment here. It's a bit darker towards the bottom of the page. So look, we've got, I want three edges on this shadow. I've got the hard edge, I've got the broken edge, and I'm just gonna mix, just get some clean water. I'm just gonna put a very small amount of clean water in here and just connect it very loosely to the paint. And that's just, just gonna give us a nice soft edge there as well. So we're varying 
the edges there, put some clean water down here and connect it to the paint. Let's do a damp and that will just give it a nice soft, uh, soft varying, varying the edges um, of the shadow. Okay, we've got one minute left. I'm going to paint the people very quickly. It's going to darken the red here just to almost push it backwards a little bit. It's another awning. Um, I want the focus to be on the awning in the middle. Uh, again, just a bit of buzz. Let that blend in. hard or, or straight lines okay people very quickly um sometimes i'll mix uh colors for skin i'm going to use the uh the escoda perla so this is a, a fine point synthetic brush i'm just going to use brilliant jean so this is opaque and it's uh, a fairly simple skin color i'm going to do one brush stroke to each head i want it to be fairly wet because i want the head Fade into the body eventually. I normally go. I normally wait till this is dry before going in, um, but I'm going to go for it, and we'll see what happens. So do some heads here with these people at the restaurant. Now I'm going to come in with some more, a bit of colour. So this is Horizon Blue. Uh, so, Hamira, how do you mix paint to create the light and shadowed part of the same building? So, uh, I just use the, the consistency of the paint. So, this wash here at the top is a, is a very weak or one quarter wash. The shadow and shade is probably a three quarter wash. So, it's a bit more uh, vivid. Okay, Horizon Blue for one person here. Horizon blue for one person here. Now we we'll change colours. Uh, let's go brilliant orange. Again, this will just be literally two or three brush strokes. Brilliant orange. Uh, let's go a darker blue. And we'll do this guy here in blue as well. Oh, we've got our waiter, so we'll, we'll give him a, a black waistcoat here and here. And we'll leave his arm white. He's got his tray. Uh, and then his trousers, and obviously the bottom of these people just kind of fade into the shadows. Um, so I don't spend too much time on, uh, on legs and, and things. There's some more table legs underneath in the shadows. So some of these white parts are in the light, some of these black uh, table legs and the backs of chairs here and here are in the background. And that just helps give it a bit more depth. Uh, and then we've got our people here that are just, uh, I'm going to have them just coming into the light. Um, we'll leave one of these people white. Uh, what do do with person? Let's do them lilac. I'm just going to use this out the tube. So this is lilac, holding lilac. And uh, we'll just use it right out the tube for a lilac. So the tops of these people are, are in the sunlight. Um, and then the bottom half are in that shadow coming in from the uh, from the awning. So 
probably don't need to put too much detail in here, but just connects um, what would be their legs coming down here, and they're already already in the shadow. And then just as this is wet, I might literally just scratch out uh, a few pieces, so the uh, those bits that are holding up the awnings, uh, some people heads of people in the background in the restaurant. I'm just using my nail. Uh, the bottom of some chairs, uh, a chair leg here and here. Um, if the paint isn't too wet, uh, you can also use a, a, a palette knife. So if the water and paint, the page consistency is getting down to damp, uh, you can always scratch little lines out as well. Uh, and sometimes you might do this with masking tape uh, before, sometimes you can do it after. So I think that painting has taken us uh, 45 minutes uh, and uh, just a bit of water just to break up some flatter areas. There's a shadow there. I don't know where that came from, but it's there now. Um, so yeah, that's taken, uh, it's taken 45 minutes to do and uh, a little bit of fun. Um, some different consistency of washes um, and some different edges as well. So I have students that attend uh, weekly workshops. I do a two hour workshop every Monday. Uh, the student will paint something like this. They'll take a photograph of their painting uh, and they'll email it into me. And I normally give them feedback, which is included in the price of the workshop uh, in four areas. And the four areas that I give feedback on are shapes. Uh, so the perspective of what they've drawn, uh, the shapes and sizes, does everything look the right size? Uh, the second part would be the overall tone of the picture. So here we're going for a lot of light and color. So we, the tone is a very bright tone, bright light of this weaker wash, the bright light here with the contrast of the shadows and the brightness of this awning. We've only really used one overpowering color, uh, which is this red here in the awning. The second one uh, would be color. So looking at what color we've used, I, I don't think it's color is a, a super uh, important thing unless as long as there's a lot of harmony uh, in that color. And then the last one is edges. So just for instance, on the shadow here, we've got a hard edge, which is a flat straight line. Uh, we've got a soft edge, which is a blurred line. And then we've got a broken edge, which is done by a quick dry brush stroke here. We've got a dry brush stroke here and we've got our blurred edges up here. So we vary different edges to achieve different effects. Um, so the last thing I just want to show you is. Um, let me see. Is just going forwards. If you guys have any questions, uh, let me know. Um, and if you're interested, again, I do weekly workshop videos. Um, they're always on Monday. Uh, they're two hours long. Um, and I just wanted to show you what we'll do over the next uh, next few weeks. Um, we have um, our November workshop schedule here. So Monday, just in four days, November 9th, um, I'll be presenting one on trees and landscapes, which is that top left-hand corner. The next Monday, people and figures. The week after, November 23rd, cityscapes. And November 30th, we'll go into portraits. Uh, the cost is 20 pounds for the two hour lesson. It includes the video where that you can keep the video and watch that as many times as you want. Uh, I've still got workshops that I did several years ago that I refer back to to help me focus on a particular technique. Um, and it also includes that feedback. You can take a photo of your work, email it in to me. I'll look over it over the next couple of days and give you whatever type of feedback you want. Some students say to me, you know what? I really want to work on my edges. Can you help me with my edges? Some students want to help on a specific scene. I really want to get better at landscapes. So I tailor the feedback to whatever you want to improve on. Uh, and it's my job to help you improve in whatever you want to keep getting better at. Um, there's information about my workshops on Instagram, on Facebook. 
um, on Twitter. Uh, but the easiest way is just email me. There's my email address at the bottom, sfraser55 at gmail.com. Um, all of those workshops you can register for online if you're interested. And also I give a discount to anyone that wants to register for all four. Rather than it being £80, it comes to £70. So really, really hope you enjoyed the workshop. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. I'll be sending you a copy of the workshop video. Uh, and good luck in your painting. E enjoy it. Have fun. Uh, for me, my personal style, I like to be as loose as I can. So be as loose as you can in your drawings. Try and get things blending and blurring for the most part. And there may be focal points where you do spend a bit of time in terms of detail. So I spent a bit more time on the figures, the bodies, uh, and the highlights of light there, because I wanted that to be the, the focal point along with that nice bright awning. So have fun. If you have any questions, please feel free to message me or email me. Um, enjoy your art and uh, hopefully look forward to painting with you guys soon if you're interested. Take care and see you all later on. I'll hang around for a few minutes. So if you do have any more questions, uh, please feel free to type them in for the next few minutes.